In terms of political radicalism, uh, one can see uh, either movements for reforms or movements for forthright action to bring about some sort of cataclysmic sweeping obliteration of the old society and replace it with a new one. Harry Haywood has a long and distinguished career as a theorist and activist for the latter view of radicalism. Born in Omaha, Nebraska, just before the turn of the century, it was his mother, born in slavery, who first taught Harry Haywood to fight for freedom. Short of height, young Harry was powerfully built and carried himself with an air of determination and fast clip of a walk which honored his dark African features. He was a soldier in France during World War I, but his venture to Europe at this time was not so much to fight for democracy as to escape from America. After the war, he settled in Chicago, where he joined the African Blood Brotherhood of Cyril Briggs. This was a Marxist nationalist splinter group drawing largely from dissidents of the Garveyites. And it was all black, and uh, Haywood saw nothing wrong with working in a self-segregated all-black organization, as long as it was revolutionary. It was the reformist bent to the Garveyites which kept Haywood out of the uh, popular Garvey movement. While working in what was a rather clandestine brotherhood, there were all kinds of trades, secrets, and uh, penalties uh, <clears throat> for giving away the secrets. Um, while working in the brotherhood, uh, Haywood added to his christened name uh, of Haywood Hall the better-known pseudonym Harry Haywood. The Brotherhood was active in labor struggles around Chicago, where Haywood lived, and uh, came to work closely with the communist-sponsored Trade Union Educational League. In the mid-twenties, Haywood left the Brotherhood to join the communist, giving as his grounds the view that Negroes were too few among the total American population to undertake revolution on their own. In 1925, Haywood went to the Soviet Union for schooling, having only completed the eighth grade in American schools. He remained some four years in Russia, traveling widely and taking an Armenian wife. Haywood had an important role in the Fourth World Congress of the Communist International held in Moscow in the fall of 1928. His travels in Russia had taken him to outlining Soviet republics, where he studied firsthand the Leninist approach to national minorities. In the summer of 1928, there was a special Moscow meeting on the Negro question. Resolutions were to be prepared for the forthcoming World Congress. Haywood and the Russian N. Nasanov presented a self-determination policy for the Negro in America. Haywood had become convinced that an independent Negro Republic in America could be created, much as ethnic, ethnic groups in the Soviet Union had regional autonomy and political control. Prior to Haywood and Asanoff's proposal, there is no known record of the Communist International even discussing a separate Negro state as a solution to the Negro question. In the early 20s, the African Blood Brotherhood had often debated the feasibility of a self-determination program, but it was Haywood who, according to uh, African Blood Brotherhood leader Cyril Briggs, uh, quote, deserves exclusive credit among American communists for raising the question of self-determination in Moscow in 1928, end quote. At the uh, summer meeting, uh, Haywood was opposed by the other Negro delegates, um, Otto Wieswood, Fort Whitman, and Haywood's own brother, Otto Hall. Uh, the program was nonetheless carried to the convention and endorsed by the Comintern. Returning to the United States in 1929, Haywood became a leading theorist for the planned Black Belt Republic. Through speeches and articles, he elaborated on the Negroes' national identity and need for a nation-state. Uh, in addition to his theoretical work, Haywood had, has had a notable career in uh, active participation in struggles, and some very dangerous ones at that. Through his knowledge of Slavic languages learned in Russia, Haywood uh, was sent to western Pennsylvania in 1931 to organize immigrant coal miners. The party made a point of sending some Negroes to work in non-Negro areas. Perhaps this uh, forced integration here of sending Haywood to Pennsylvania was meant to balance the implied black nationalism in the proposed Negro Republic. The Pennsylvania miners nicknamed Haywood the Black Slav, 
and as their organizer, he had the honor of leading the charge of 300 workers on two machine gun positions at the Battle of Bentleyville. Uh, this was a Bentleyville was a typical mining town which fought strikes in the style of the day by importing scabs and then protecting them with a small army of armed thugs, in this case two machine gunners posted at the entrance to the mine. At the big battle, Haywood announced that the strikers were going to go to the mines and oust the scabs if they had to walk right over those machine guns. The virtually unarmed strikers were but 50 feet from the gunners when the thugs, without firing, leapt from their positions and ran. When the communists took over the defense of the Scottsboro case, the Scottsboro Boys in Alabama, uh, it was the cue for the party's organizers to move into the Deep South. Haywood was assigned to organize a workers and unemployed council in Memphis. At the time, 1932, Memphis was one of the more corrupt towns in the United States. Under the machine of Boss Crump, the police were killing Negroes in Memphis on an average of nearly one a week. Haywood and his two fellow organizers had just arrived when the police arbitrarily shot and killed a young Negro in full view of a Negro woman witness. The organizers employed tactics now popularized by Saul Alensky by organizing around immediate community issues, in this case murder. A mock trial was staged with prosecutor, judge, and jury, and in the Negro church the police were found guilty. Memphis City officials were about to call a hearing on the case when the eyewitness mysteriously disappeared. Haywood was all for pressing the case anyway, but at a crucial meeting of the local NAACP, a motion to support the, quote, communist, end quote, campaign failed of passing by one vote. Haywood uh, interpreted the NAACP action as an Uncle Tom's sellout by black bourgeoisie, which controlled the local branch. He didn't get to stay around and argue the point. He received a telephone tip that police were looking for him to dish out the same treatment given the eyewitness. Haywood's experiences in the South left him extremely bitter toward the black middle classes. In a report to the 1934 Communist Party convention, he expounded at length on the race misleaders of the NAACP, Urban League, Negro Press, Garveyites, and other petty bourgeois nationalists. In general, Haywood's writings during the 30s earned him a title of party hatchet man for denunciations of black nationalists. It should be noted that his strident criticisms of nationalists were not so much integrationist criticisms as revolutionary criticisms of reformists. His stock phrase for the nationalists was that they were petty bourgeois and distractors from the central fight for revolution. He had his own national solution in the Black Belt Republic, which he felt ought to have been acceptable to any nationalist who was not a mere opportunist out for his own monetary gain. Criticisms such as those of Haywood have helped create among nationalists a long-standing belief that communist and communism uh, is the enemy of black nationalism. The uh, Spanish Civil War found Haywood trudging across the Pyrenees as part of the American Lincoln Brigade, bringing aid to the Loyalists and fighting Franco and Hitler. The tour of duty in Spain kept him away from home during the major party policy shift to a united front with the New Deal. Cooperation with liberalism caused a go-slow approach to many of the party's radical programs. The proposed Black Belt Republic was made a secondary goal to that of integration. Upon his return to America, Haywood found himself in strained relations with the party hierarchy. During the war, he watched as the party liquidated many of its activities in the South. Then in 1946, he uh, eagerly joined in the purge of Earl Browder and others who had directed the party down the path of social democracy and reformism. Haywood, uh, during the war years, had been working as a seaman shipping out of Los Angeles. And uh, the purge of reformist Browder cleared the way for a new interest in the Black Belt Republic, and Haywood used his spare time at sea to write a lengthy treatise on Negro liberation. Um, designed as a justification of the Black Belt Republic, Negro liberation was heavy on theory and light on practical solutions. The basic thesis was not supported in detail on, on how political control was to be achieved. 
nor was there much treatment of the actual mechanics of how whites would fit or not fit in the republic. The black belt would be controlled by black workers and their white worker allies, according to the theory, but how the two groups were going to work together was not explained. Haywood left these problems to the course of the revolution to come. When he wrote his book, 1946-47, Haywood believed the revolution to achieve the republic would be carried out through the American Communist Party. However, in 1957, he quit the party in a bitter row over what he considered to be a turn toward moderation. Today, uh, the militancy of black power has given Haywood new hope and ultimate freedom for black Americans. He has been working to update the idea of an independent republic. Recent writings serialized in Soul Book magazine foresee a de facto republic emerging out of the efforts of groups like SNCC, the Deacons for Defense of Justice, Modern Sharecroppers, Cooperatives, and Black Panthers. Haywood considers himself today to be both a socialist and a black nationalist, a little of both traditions being something of a requirement for one to remain a revolutionary. <laughs>